So this video is video number two on peace leadership skills. Perhaps you've uh, viewed my other video, Everyday Conflict Prevention Skills. These two videos, uh, webinars rather, are part of what we call the Online Dispute Resolution Expert Package. So hopefully you've uh, registered to take this training and once you've registered at the end of this webinar, there's a video uh, quiz and you can submit the quiz for review and upon successful review of your quiz, um, you can add this training to your Brave One profile. So like I mentioned, this is video or webinar number two. We're focusing on peace leadership skills and uh, this is part of the four video package. So upcoming videos will include preventing youth violence and then power, anger, and assertiveness. So in terms of an overview of this webinar, I want to cover three main topics. And by the way, um, I'm planning to run for approximately one hour today, just so you're aware of that. So the three main topics that we're going to look at over the coming hour include the need for peace leaders. It's a very good starting place to begin. Um, does the world need peace leaders? or are we okay, so to speak? Secondly, what kind of lessons can we learn from past and current peace leaders? What do peace leaders do or have done in the past that make them effective at creating large scale social, social changes? Three, thirdly, how to become a peace leader and how to inspire others to do so. So three main topics we're looking at today, the need for peace leaders, lessons from peace leaders, and how to become a peace leader. Okay, so like I mentioned, our starting point for our inquiry into peace leadership skills is to address this question of, does the world need more peace leaders? And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and, I'm say, and say, uh, just based on the fact that you are here um, and you're part of the Brave One platform, um, I, would, I would assume that you agree that the world does need more peace leaders and that you are indeed budding peace leaders because you're already here. However, um, we can't deny the fact that there are a lot of people out there that uh, would probably argue this point and say, well, no, we don't necessarily need more peace leaders. But the perspective that I would like to share with you is that, yes, we do need more peace leaders. So it is probably a huge understatement to say that the challenges the world currently faces are serious, numerous, intertwined, complex, and require innovative or what we might say creative solutions. So let's just take a moment to pause before I don't want to rush to the next point. Let's, let's pause and kind of unpack that statement for a moment and think now uh, of the current state of global affairs. And by global affairs, I don't necessarily mean what's happening only on the world stage, but just what's happening in the world outside, the world around you, the world outside your front door. Um, you know, if you watch the news on a regular basis, I think it will become very, very evident that there are numerous serious problems. And if we begin to look at how do we address them, you'll see that they are interlinked and that, um, let me just take one example, you know, like next, my next video is going to be on peace leadership or pardon me on youth, uh, preventing youth violence. And in terms of a real example, um, you know, if we think about gangs and gun violence and we say, okay, well, I don't want to give too much away from next week, but I do want to make a point here. But uh, if we're talking about addressing gangs and youth violence and gun violence and we say, okay, this is a problem. It's kind of one problem here that we're going to address it. Um, the more you dig into it, you realize that it's a very complex problem and that there are numerous kind of uh, different root causes to this problem that need to be addressed. <clears throat> and so you'll say there's economic 
issues maybe that are fueling gun violence. There are societal and cultural issues that are fueling it. There are, um, you know, family dynamics and so on and so forth. So you realize that there, a simple solution to gun violence doesn't really exist and that you're going to have to undertake numerous different actions um, by different people. So it'll involve, you know, social workers and uh, family therapists and uh, community support workers and so on and so forth. So just taking one simple problem that we're facing, gun, gun violence, and unpacking it, it illustrates that it's a serious issue um, and it's intertwined with other issues and that it's complex and it will require some creative thinking. And so if you're interested in learning more about that particular topic, I'll invite you to join my next webinar because I'll be really digging quite deeply into some of that stuff about you know what drives youth violence. Anyhow, the point we're making right now is that most people would probably agree that if you look around you, there's lots of uh, problems out there that need peace leadership. So Einstein once famously remarked that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. In other words, many, many, many years ago, when Einstein was alive and came up with this idea, um, he recognized that one way to move our culture forward and to solve our problems and to create positive social changes is through innovative, creative thinking, that we have to um, be, become more creative. Okay, so... <clears throat> To further illustrate this point, I would say, unfortunately, what we're seeing all too often is the usual knee-jerk responses to these challenges that demonstrate the same old, rather tired thinking that created these problems in the first place. So let me see if I can try to come up with an example for that. Um, one global challenge that the world has been facing uh, and has been on the news quite a bit recently has to do with North Korea and North Korea's development of an intercontinental ballistic missile uh, possibly tipped with a nuclear warhead and this is a very serious problem obviously and so far the policy makers the politicians the diplomats and so on and so forth the people that are new usually tasked with resolving these kind of international conflicts are feeling rather stuck that there's not a lot of options and so that you know we say sanctions we have sanctions in place but let's put more intense sanctions on so we're not really seeing any kind of new creative new thinking that might approach the problem in a different way and I'm just kind of firing this off the top of my head, so I'm not sure if it would necessarily work. But just to illustrate the point, you know, perhaps if we viewed it instead of, you know, if we said, why is North Korea acting the way it's acting and what are its interests in pursuing nuclear capabilities and so on and so forth, and what if we reframed the problem as a global security challenge or at least a regional security issue uh, obviously uh, Japan and South Korea have security concerns along with the United States um, you know instead of making it a problem of the United States with North Korea take a regional approach and you know see if we could get uh, greater coordination between lots of regional actors and regional countries to address the problem now I don't necessarily know if that'll work but I'm just trying to illustrate the idea that maybe with some creative new thinking we can take different approaches to some of the problems we're facing. <clears throat> so the second bullet point here, indeed what we really need are more creative solutions to some of these global problems as Einstein reminds us and we need people who are willing to implement the sometimes more difficult and riskier options. So such people might be deemed peace leaders. Peace leaders are brave in their courage to try out new things, to take risks and to challenge the status quo.
So, if we... Hopefully I've established for you now that, at least in my view, <clears throat> the world needs peace leaders. And peace leaders are people who can shake things up and find new ways to solve the problems going on around us. And unfortunately, when, um, when I was putting together this presentation, I began to think about who are the historical peace leaders. And the unfortunate part is I, I, it was very difficult to come up with a list of like say 20 people. So I would encourage you to think about, you know, can you think of any other peace leaders? But here are some that I came up with. So President Jimmy Carter, uh, well known for uh, the Jimmy Carter Center in Atlanta, where they do uh, work around the world to uh, deal with uh, violence and ending wars and preventing guinea worm disease and working on polio, I think. Uh, but before that, as president, he, uh, he made a landmark uh, peace deal in the Middle East. Okay, Gandhi, who was a Indian um, spiritual leader uh, when India was still a colony of Britain, and he led a non-violent uprising against the British uh, that involved uh, taxes on salt, the production of salt. Mother Teresa, who you all know uh, as a saint, who is well known for working with poor people. <clears throat> the Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, of course a huge figure in American culture and uh, uh, widely recognized for social changes he created. The Dalai Lama, <clears throat> who I believe is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, if I recall correctly, um, exiled from uh, Nepal, I believe, and has become a, a, a voice to inspire people to work towards peace. Uh, Russian uh, President Mikhail Gorbachev, I don't know if you'll remember him, but uh, some would argue that in the 1980s, uh, he was responsible for uh, the reforms that took place in the former Soviet Union, leading eventually and partially to the collapse of the Berlin Wall that divided Berlin. And someone who's in my newsfeed uh, lately, uh, Liu Zibo, uh, per forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but if you Google uh, China Tiananmen tank man. Uh, he's the gentleman that uh, there was a Tiananmen Square uprising many, many years ago. The uh, Chinese government, if I understand it correctly, dispatched the military to uh, violently suppress and break up the, uh, the uprising. There was a movement for democracy and greater uh, human rights and so on and so forth. And there's a famous picture where this man alone stood in front of a column of tanks and he held up the tanks and uh, it took a courageous act of uh, self-sacrifice and indeed he paid the uh, he paid the price because I understand correctly uh, if I understand it correctly uh, as a result of his actions to try to block um, the military from uh, from breaking from uh, breaking up the protest movement he was consequently uh, jailed, uh, probably uh, tortured or, or abused. I'll have to look into that. But anyways, he, he there's a famous picture if you look up Tiananmen Square Tank Man, where this gentleman, uh, you know, took an action to try to create peace. So when you compare, this is what one, two, three, four, five. This is seven peace leaders, and you know, I'm someone who studies and researches and teaches about <laughs> peace leadership and conflict resolution and peace building. And uh, unfortunately, like I said, I had a hard time trying to create a list of like, say, 15 or 20 people. So the idea being that, you know, if we go back to the earlier thought that there are lots of problems out there and there's therefore a need for peace leaders. But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of peace leaders. And a lot of these people on this list here are now deceased. Um, so who are the contemporary peace leaders? Who are the current peace leaders? And and what are they doing? Um, and if you think about, say, the opposite of that, you say, well, who are the 
uh, war heroes, you know, that or the generals and, and so on and so forth. As a culture, we seem to have a lot, <clears throat> a lot easier of a time putting uh, military officials and generals and, and great soldiers up on a pedestal and celebrating their successes and writing movies about them and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, peace leaders seem to not get the same recognition. So, can you think of others? Okay, so <clears throat> the question is then, if we look at that small list of peace leaders and we want to try to learn lessons from them, we want to try to say, what did they do or what did they not do that made them effective as peace leaders? Um, we can begin to generate a list of ideas here. And so the starting point is, I would say that, uh, and I could be wrong here in the sense that maybe they just jump up and take action and they don't really have a vision, but my sense was that a lot of peace leaders have a vision in their mind of a reality that they want to create or a change that they want to create that perhaps others around them don't see so there's a visionary aspect to their work. Uh, secondly, you know, we've, it's one thing to have a vision in your mind, but it's another thing to take that idea or that vision or that change you want to see and accurately describe it to other people and inspire them to work towards it and to have them come on board and support it. So you could imagine how many possible initiatives or positive changes just never get off the ground because someone who's a potential peace leader maybe has an idea in their head and said, you know, oh, I'd really like to see this change made in my school or my workplace or my community. But if they never act on that idea, if they don't share that idea with others, if they don't try to initiate a change in the world, then the potential of that idea is never fully realized. So peace leaders have a vision Peace leaders can share and describe that vision with others and inspire hope and, and get them on board to support it. Uh, peace leaders will denounce the use of violence and they will follow other admirable values. So uh, Gandhi, for example, to go back to his, uh, his case, he inspired his leader uh, his people to not he well he's well recognized for nonviolent protest and really what are the methods of nonviolent action <clears throat> and he was very um, committed to that idea um, many peace leaders will take selfless action uh, for the benefit of the many so in other words they sacrifice, they make sacrifices or personal sacrifice. So going back to the Chinese dissident, um, you know, he probably knew very well standing up to the Chinese state, standing up to the Chinese military, that he was going to face some kind of very serious consequence. But he did it to make a statement to try to inspire others to say, look at you can stand up to military force. <clears throat> Peace leaders often work tirelessly in the face of extreme adversity. So in other words, they're working in very difficult conditions where all of the factors can be conspiring, conspiring against them. Uh, it's almost like a David and Goliath situation in some situations where, you know, um, all of the forces are trying to push you down and you're just one little person trying to make a difference. And the, I would add to this, you know, sometimes the work of peace leaders, not only do they work tirelessly, but we should almost put in brackets after that. They work tirelessly sometimes behind the scenes. And so they're not always in the public spotlight and they don't always get the recognition that they deserve. And, and maybe in some cases they don't necessarily want it. But I mean, I think that could be partially to explain why I had such, such a difficult time, you know, listing, say, 15 contemporary peace leaders, because often these people are working quietly in the background to make changes in subtle ways. 
Uh, well, there it is. It's on the next bullet point. Peace leader, leaders are egoless, and they're not very concerned with taking credit for the results of their actions. Uh, peace leaders take risks that could compromise their personal safety, their reputation, or their standing in society. So they may they may be discredited. I mean, that's a tactic that a lot of uh, <clears throat> abusive regimes will take is that they will try to attack the character of someone um, and discredit them and that's a way to undermine their message <clears throat> peace leaders seldom operate as lone wolves rather they build large and extensive networks of support for their efforts and so that becomes a key to uh, sustaining the change is how do we build a network of support to have this change uh, take hold. Uh, peace leaders often seem to be driven by a higher sense of purpose, whereas uh, you and I and kind of the everyday uh, people are concerned with, uh, you know, just getting by on a daily basis and, and raising our families and uh, making sure we do good at work and at school. Uh, peace leaders seem to be cut from a different cloth in the sense that they, they seem to be driven by some kind of higher sense of uh, pursuing some kind of ideal like uh, uh, justice or liberty or freedom or, uh, or peace that, you know, that I'm putting all other concerns aside because I'm pursuing this ideal. Um, peace leaders have a great impact by changing the entire system or the structure. Peace leaders take advantage of existing momentum or they can create movement when things are stuck. And that's quite a skill to have. And actually that links to negotiation in some ways. Uh, peace leaders take action with a sense of urgency. In other words, I see a change that needs to be made um, I'm going to uh, commit myself to trying to make this change and it has to happen now or yesterday. So in other words, they have, they're driven by a higher sense of purpose and that things have to happen now. So business as usual uh, is the common phrase. Business as usual is no longer possible or even desirable. So they're saying this is a bad situation or this is a situation that needs to change. Here's how we can change it, and we're going to try to change it, make these changes right away. Um, lastly, peace leaders have a variety of peace building tools at their disposal, and they can use them or apply them in a very skillful way. So I already mentioned that uh, Gandhi, for example, is more or less credited with coming up with some of the tools of nonviolent action, such as uh, protests and marches and sit-ins. But what are some of the other tools that peace leaders may use? Well, here is one set of tools, and this is, I would caution you that this is an, uh, not a comprehensive list, and really there are uh, many, many, many more tools than this. But if we begin to think about what kind of tools can peace leaders use in our community um, today to help to create nonviolent communities, these are some of the tools that I would say are important. So first of all, economic opportunities. If I want to reduce violence in my community, um, if everyone is prospering, if everyone is doing well economically and they have enough money to pay their rent and to put food on the table, then I would argue that uh, violence is less likely. Um, we can help to support the growth of nonviolent peaceful communities by promoting inclusive dialogue as peaceful leaders. So um, this is about people wanting to have a say in matters that affect them. And I would argue that this applies from not only the family level, but all the way through to the workplace to, of course, uh, national matters. And in some ways, I mean, that's why uh, we have uh, participatory um, elections, you know, so it's that you can have a say in how you're governed. But I mean, even in the workplace, you know, there's a difference between um, kind of having a dictator type of 
uh, a toxic environment where you know you don't have any kind of say in uh, major decisions that affect you and that can lead to uh, a kind of a negative um, workplace and so one of the tools to overcome that would be through say inclusive dialogue um, accessible education that's pretty straightforward having a variety of social support services so if people need different types of assistance and so on and so forth uh, community policing um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when I get to the youth violence uh, webinar which is upcoming but uh, community policing is a different style of policing where uh, the police are very much viewed as active community members and maybe police patrol in the neighborhood where they live and they take a different approach to policing and the, um, the intent behind that tool is that communities will be safer um, and more peaceful through community policing. Sustainable development and participatory planning, in other words, having a say in uh, planning issues that are going on around you. So this is just a small list of different tools that peace leaders can use, dialogue, uh, so on and so forth, but you know, we can add to this, of course, mediation. And so mediation and dialogue are um, two tools that will be used primarily through the Brave online platform as Brave Ones. And so you might find yourself trying to inspire or open up dialogue as a peace leader between two parties that are in a conflict and helping them to mediate any conflicts and to uh, maybe to negotiate new solutions to any problems that they're facing. So uh, peace leaders are familiar with a variety of tools and they know how to skillfully apply them. Okay, so they have a vision, they can share that vision, they can build hope, um, but let's drill down a little bit here and address this question about how do peace leaders create change. So peace leaders can frame problems in such a manner that new win-win solutions can be identified more easily. So what I'm talking about here is that there could be two parties in a conflict. It could be two members of your family or two neighbors or, or two people in your workplace or, or whatever. And it's very easy for the people experiencing the conflict to just kind of throw their hands up in the air and say, you know, this is hopeless. It's a ridiculous situation. Uh, you know, there's really no solution to this. Um, and what happens then as a peace leader, and, and again, this goes back to inspiring hope. Uh, how do you give people hope? Well, you have to take a positive kind of stance and you have to say, yeah, you've got a problem. And don't undermine the seriousness of the problem. So you say, well, this is a serious problem and I recognize that. And the consequences of this problem are serious. However, have you considered that we don't have to, cons we don't have to look at this as a win-lose situation where, you know, one of you is going to walk out of here feeling very disappointed and sour. And are there any ways for you to reach a win-win solution? And what, what would that look like? What, what form would that take? And so you're, you're creating, you're giving them a, a glimmer of hope or putting a little light into a dark situation. And you're saying, look, it, let's rethink this whole situation and see if there's any kind of positive outcome or where there's a win-win solution possible. Okay, so that's part one. Peace leaders create change by motivating others towards taking helpful actions and they can build a broad coalition of support, support to sustain the changes that they are implementing. So we've kind of touched upon that before. I, I said you can't just have an idea in your mind, but you have to get that idea out there and then get people on board with it and try to build a coalition of support. Peace leaders create positive and lasting changes that benefit many people over the well-being of just a few. 
So that seems to be a common theme is that if you want the change to be accepted and you want people to get on board, uh, there has to be, well, in the international peace building literature, we call it peace dividends. So the idea is that if there's a country that's at war, and there's two groups in that country that are at war, uh, somehow they are benefiting from fighting each other. Their, their needs or their interests are being met through the violence. And that if the mediator comes and helps assist them to reach a peace deal, a peace agreement, um, there's a risk that the peace agreement can collapse after it's signed if the effects, the positive effects of the new peace deal aren't felt widely by everybody kind of very quickly. And so we call that the peace dividend. What are the positive effects of peace? And the idea is that if everybody can really quickly um, say, wow, this peace is great. I mean, now I can do this or I can do that or it's benefited my business or whatever. If that kind of positive effects of peace can be felt by a wide segment of the population, then that peace agreement is more likely to be implemented and sustained. On the contrary, if the peace agreement is signed and only a few handful of politicians are benefiting from it and the regular people aren't really feeling the positive effects of the peace agreement, then the idea is that they're more likely that the war will restart. So in other words, whether it's a peace agreement in an international war or trying to create a positive change in your community as a peace leader, you want to create positive changes and you want to have lasting changes. And one of the ways to ensure that your changes will be lasting and sustained is to make sure that everyone experiences the, uh, the benefits of the change and try to make it inclusive in that regard. Okay, peace leaders can also shake up the system to remove outdated or limiting rules and regulations. So if the system that they are operating in, whether it's a family dynamic system or a, a local policies of, you know, in the community and local rules and regulations, if those are stifling positive growth and if they're stifling positive change, and if they're stifling the, the kind of peace dividends for everybody, uh, peace leaders have to get creative and think about, well, how do we work around those rules and regulations? Or how do we undertake a process to challenge those rules and regulations and have them modified or removed in order to support our mission of creating peace? Lastly, peace leaders consciously use conflict as an ideal opportunity for initiating deep transformation. So this kind of mirrors in some ways the very first bullet point. But what I'm saying here is that when a conflict arises, again, it's very easy to view it in negative connotations and negative ways and say this conflict's going to be draining and it's not going to be good for us and it's going to create all kinds of problems and it's hopeless and you know I'm going to have to fight my way out of this and only one of us is going to win a peace leader not only do you inspire the parties to think well maybe there's a win-win solution here but you say you know maybe the fact that this conflict's arising is a sign or a symptom that some kind of deeper underlying transformation has to occur and you know maybe that means restructuring the organization or maybe that means changing uh some way the family operates um, what you're saying is that the conflict is an opportunity for positive growth and positive transformation and you have to try to again transmit that uh, sense of hope to the parties okay so we're talking a lot in this webinar about how peace leaders inspire and uh, sustain changes and we've touched upon a number of different ideas up to this point and I think to summarize it, there are really three very simple steps or three key ways to create a change. And uh, again, this is almost rather overly simplified, but one, there's a bunch of stuff around the vision aspect. Um, 
you can jump to starting a change step number two without a vision but without a vision um it's harder to kind of sell the idea to people and to sustain the change and if you don't really know what you're working towards then uh, you could be working ineffectively and inefficiently so i would say really in most cases you have to have a very clear vision so that's the that first step or the first key to creating a change as a peace leader secondly um, like i've alluded to earlier in this video you have to be able to take that vision you have as the peace leader and move it outwards from your own mind kind of out into the real world and start a change somehow and then once the change is started you have to sustain it so very straight and clear and uh, straightforward so let's begin to look at then a deeper uh, examination of each of those three keys and so the vision of the peace leaders and I don't necessarily have any answers for this because you know I haven't sat down and interviewed any peace leaders or done any research on this so to speak but it raises an interesting question and perhaps you have some answers to this uh, where does the vision of peace leaders come from Perhaps it's from intuition, uh, insight. Perhaps it's from reading philosophy. Perhaps from religion. Perhaps from spiritual beliefs. But the idea is how come there's very few people in our society that are aware of all the problems around us and can develop some kind of vision about, hey, things could be different. We can make this kind of change. We can make this kind of improvement. Here's a creative new solution that no one else has thought of. So I don't necessarily have an answer. I don't know where peace leaders get their vision from or if it's even possible to, to, uh, to identify that. However, we maybe don't have to be concerned about that because we're talking about your ability to be a peace leader in this webinar and nurturing that. And so I would ask, I invite you now to ask yourself, um, how can I develop my ability to be a visionary? So as a peace leader, you have to be able to develop a vision about something. And then where do those come from? So going forward to put the ideas into practice, how can you develop your ability to be more of a visionary? Okay, so the second key then to peace leadership, like I mentioned before, was starting a change. And I would argue that uh, some people feel like um, it's such a big problem that we're facing, what can little old me do? And that, you know, I'm not going to take any actions or any changes until, you know, lots of changes all have to happen at once. And I would say yes, in some circumstances that might be preferable to undertake a whole lot of action really quickly. However, I would argue on the contrary that in some ways no action is too small. And I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of the butterfly effect, um, but the butterfly effect uh, was discovered, if I recall correctly, by a biologist um, many years ago who basically has theory was as he studied global ecosystems and the interconnectedness of uh, the different things on the planet, different systems and so on and so forth, um, he re the famous butterfly effect is that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Japan, it can create a, a, a rainstorm on the other side of the planet. And the idea being that one small change one small action on one side of the planet because everything is so interlinked and interconnected can create this huge effect somewhere else in the system so that's why i have on the right side of this slide this idea of different ripples uh, of change and i would say create small ripples that grow outwards and that is actually called the snowball effect, which is different from the butterfly effect. But the snowball effect is um, if you are someone that lives where there is snow or you've ever visited a, a place with snow, 
and you've made a snowman, you know very well that you start with a very small handful of snow, a snowball, in your mitts or your gloves, and uh, you pack that down, and the idea is that you roll it and roll it and roll it, and before you know it, it's picking up so much snow that it's spiraling out of control and it's growing huge. So the idea is that in some cases, you know, no action is too small. We can initiate change by triggering a very small action that can grow and ripple throughout the system. So in other words, some people never make it past this point as peace leaders. They'll have a great vision, but then they just say, well, I can't, I don't know how to get started. I don't know where to go with this vision. I can't get this change happening. And some people get caught up in their own mind and their own thinking. And we call that the paralysis of analysis, where they keep on analyzing and reanalyzing the situation and thinking of what well, the what if this and what if that and did we consider this and we did, did we consider that and they they spend so much time overthinking things and analyzing things that they don't ever actually do anything paralysis of analysis and so i would argue that in some cases you just have to set that aside and say we've thought this through enough let's let's start a change okay so then you've got your vision you've started your change and of course you know if that change collapses after an hour or a day or doesn't last a month or a year uh, this all speaks to the uh, importance of trying to find ways to sustain the changes you're creating as peace leaders so um, one of the ideas here is creating critical mass and this is a theory that basically says uh, for any kind of like change that's going to occur, uh, it takes one person to be the, uh, the instigator of the change or the peace leader or the visionary. And that uh, when you're looking at, say, like a group of people, uh, that one peace leader may get like a follower or two followers or three followers. And then that grows to five or six or seven. And at first they're kind of viewed as outcasts and, and strange people because they're doing things differently but eventually what happens is there's called the tipping point and you get enough people on board with your cause that it reaches a tipping point and then uh it, it um everything kind of flips and everything changes and then you suddenly accumulate a critical mass where now you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people uh making the change that you instigated so there's a, a famous uh, video clip that I usually show when I teach this uh, idea to different university students. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the video clip here, but it, I can quickly talk you through it because it's a funny little example. Um, there's a video clip on YouTube. You can probably find it later. It's a guy uh, at a dance festival, uh, outdoor music festival, and he's up on a hill. And uh, basically, he's dancing by himself kind of in a funny way, and everyone else is sitting kind of looking at him and pointing and laughing. And so he is the visionary. He is the person outside the box. He is the person doing things differently. What happens is one other gentleman uh, walks over and, and starts dancing with him and dancing kind of in a, in a weird, crazy, funny way. And then two or three people come over, and then four or five. And then suddenly, there's just a mass... Uh, uh, um, people just start streaming from all over the hill and suddenly there's like 50 or 100 people all dancing at once so all it took was this one gentleman to kind of illustrate you know like hey guys you can get up and stand on this hill and start dancing and then everybody kind of joined them so uh, a, a great example of, uh, re of creating a critical mass and reaching a tipping point so uh, I've kind of alluded to this before but one of the ways, this is more of a practical tip rather than a large kind of a theoretical way to sustain a change, but if you create a change, uh, you can sustain it by linking it to systems and getting buy-in from the people in those systems. So imagine, you know, you're trying to work with the local school system to uh, implement, you know, a new anti-bullying program in the school. So as a peace leader, you're saying, you know, bullying is a problem that we want to address, and I have a vision for how uh, we can do that. And, you know, you could get maybe uh, some buy-in, like maybe from one teacher, to try to set up an anti-bullying program. 
but if it's not tied into the rest of the school, then you know no one's going to come to the program and it's not going to get any support and no one will show up. But if you kind of ready the ground for your program by giving a presentation to the parent uh, teacher association and getting all of their support and, and they get on board with it and then you have meetings with all of the other teachers in the school and you have meetings with the, uh, the principal and the vice principal and you're, you're building, you're working within the system there to get a bunch of people on board with your vision and um, you might have to make some, you know, different policy changes to help um, have your program really integrated into the school system. So instead of just having your changes kind of free floating and disconnected from things and, and being crushed by the current system, you can take deliberate conscious steps to tie your change that you're trying to create into existing systems and institutions, get buy-in from the people in those systems and get them on your side and get them supporting your efforts. And sometimes that takes what we call a champion, a champion within the system where you have one person, usually in a higher up position, who subscribes to your idea and who does support it and who does buy into it and you get that champion on your side, you get them on board, and then what they do is because they're already well integrated into the, the culture, the system, they put in a good word for you and they say, hey everybody, you know, at their next meeting, there's a new anti-bullying program happening on Tuesdays after school, and uh, you know, I don't know if you're all aware of it, but I met with the, the person setting it up and it's amazing, and make sure you refer all your students to it and let's, let's all get on board and support it. So sometimes it just takes one champion within the system to buy into your idea to have them promote it. Okay, conclusion. I would say uh, we all have the potential to be peace leaders. What we're not lacking, unfortunately, is a shortage of opportunities to practice being peace leaders. So let's find and support the peace leaders in our families, in our communities, and our workplaces. And as I mentioned before, obviously by you being here and participating in this webinar, you are a growing peace leader. So let's find support for you. So let's light the way for others by making ourselves peace leaders. And I share with you as a closing thought that helps to kind of tie all of this together and hopefully inspire you going forward. Um, about a year or two ago, probably about, yeah, pardon me, probably about two years ago, I decided that there was a need for what we would call a peace leader's oath. And I put this together and I share it with you now and I would consider you to um, think about whether you'd like to pursue this peace leader's oath. So I recognize that there are bad people doing bad things in the world and that there are good people sometimes forced into doing bad things. I know it only takes one person to stand up against the darkness to light the way for others. I know it is okay to have, to have high standards and expect others to follow them. This is how we evolve, how we progress, how we create a peaceful civilization. I will do the right thing when facing a difficult choice. I recognize that life is both mysterious and sacred, and I will act to protect all living things. I have power, and I intentionally choose to use it constructively. I am willing to sacrifice and be selfless in the pursuit of peace. I vow to live my life as a peace leader.